Hello! Welcome to the 21st Century Armchair Anthropology Podcast. In this podcast series, my colleague Dragana and I are going to talk about digital ethnography as a method employed in social research. My name is Estrea Pejevic. I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology at the Central European University in Budapest. In this first episode, we will introduce ourselves and talk a little bit about how we got interested in digital ethnography at the first place. We will also enlist the biggest issues and fears we have with digital ethnography. And finally, we will talk a little bit how it is different or similar with traditional ethnography. You can also visit our blog, armchairanthropology21.wordpress.com. There, we share additional information about our digital adventure. So, Dragana, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Dragana Kovacic-Bilitsky, and I have a PhD from the University of Oslo. Currently, I'm a visiting research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies Kosek in Hungary. Together with Estrella. Yes, we are today in Kuseg, as Dragana said, which is a charming little city on the border between Hungary and Austria. We are both fellows at the Institute of Advanced Studies, Kuseg, and uh, unfortunately, as the rest of the world, we are locked down during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic stopped the world for a certain period of time. So what happened with both Dragana and me is that now we have to adapt our research plans to being locked at home, basically. And what we started to do is to explore digital methods in social research. So. Dragana, my first question for you would be then, did you have any previous experiences with using digital or how, mm-hmm. how did you do it? I guess it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's kind mm-hmm. of a redundant question. We all use digital these days, mm-hmm. but how did you employ it previous to this situation? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, up until this point, I never called myself a digital ethnographer or digital researcher. But when I stopped and thought about what I've done, I've always partially did that without uh, naming it as such. And I got interested in uh, online research. It was during uh, the time when I did research for my PhD. I was interested in identity and belonging of second generation migrants, or actually one and a half generation migrants, as uh, I call them in my research, because they were all children when they migrated during the wars. The research uh, was in Norway, people were from former Yugoslavia, grew up in Norway. The main question was how they identify these days, considering like not only national, but all sorts of group identities. And then one of the things that I realized at the time, because I started uh, in 2012, was that social media getting a really important uh, place in how people present themselves. And you couldn't avoid it if you talk about identity. So although I interviewed people face to face of course i contacted them online like for initial kind of contact and then i would be friended by them after after i interviewed them and i was able to follow a lot of the like uh, things that interested me i was able to follow it afterwards and i analyzed facebook groups directly for my research for various reasons so I knew back then that like, okay, I'm getting really interested in what's happening online and this is really important for their offline lives and for my research. But like I said, I'd never called myself an online researcher. But I was also at the same time um, mostly interested in ethics of online research. So what are you allowed to use, what you're not? So that was what was preoccupying me. But now I'm getting more and more interested also in... uh, mechanics of online research, not only ethics. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And can you maybe tell us what was your uh, idea before the Mm COVID-19 situation Mm -hmm. and uh, not idea, but what what was your research Mm -hmm. uh, research proposal about Mm -hmm. and uh, how are you planning to adapt it um, Mm -hmm. 
for this digital mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to primarily rely on interviews because uh, uh, I got interested in extremist groups and I thought that uh, that's the best way to do it. But then I knew that also they do a lot of their uh, uh, activism and all sorts of other things online. So uh, the way I proposed it, it was like, I will do research, I will contact people, interview them, that will be my main material. And then I will supplement that by analysis of relevant for websites or social media. So that was the what I planned, but of course I can't. Uh, the, the, the the largest part, the most important part, I had to drop. And I was thinking, what to do? Should I replace it with Skype interviews? In my case, I decided not to. In some maybe uh, other types of research, it's uh, it's very relevant to just switch from face to face to online interviews. In my case, I didn't think it was a good solution right now because. Uh, gaining kind of trust and getting into the field would be difficult if I'm only somebody contacting people online. I think it will be, there will be a lot of suspicion and problems related to it. And uh, yeah, that's it. But uh, tell me how you adapted your project because of everything that happened. I, I research uh, commemoration of the 1999 uh, bombing of Serbia in, in commemoration of the bombing of Serbia in Serbia mm -hmm. and uh, the project that I work on here is uh, concretely uh, concentrated on uh, how narratives around uh, depleted uranium are uh, created alongside the commemorative practices and how the depleted uranium becomes part of, of commemoration basically and uh, I had a plan to go to Serbia and to spend uh, this actual period uh, between uh, end of March and maybe like mid-May in Serbia because it's the period when bombing occurred and when different commemorative events happen in Serbia. And of course, because of the pandemic, my research is cancelled, but also commemorations are cancelled as well. So everything in a way moved to the online sphere or world or online what, which is, I would say, my biggest question when, when we think about digital ethnography. What do we actually research? Is it a space? Is mm -hmm. it a place? What do we talk about when we say digital or online or whatever? So I guess in a way now I'm doing ethnography of COVID-19 as well, because it extremely influenced these commemorative practices. And um, it was only now that I actually realized how important this online world is. It's not something that is only additional to, but it's, it's the world for itself that can easily adapt to different situations like this one is. So it is something that I will try to look into mm -hmm. during this period but i wanted to ask you when when you realize that this uh, digital push or digital mm -hmm. turn is going to happen to you now what was your biggest concern did you have any particular fear or issue with it well i mean my biggest concern would be um i really believe that the best kind of research on the topics that uh, you and i are dealing with can be done in combination of uh uh, the, with the combination of offline and online methods. So you can't completely say you don't want to call yourself digital ethnographer or digital researcher. You're still going to use a lot of online uh, methods. Uh, and in some cases, they're going to be very appropriate. But uh, I think that, for example, for my research, this topic, but also in any other topic that I've researched so far, I don't see how it can be done entirely online and still have a connection to real life. So, uh, I mean, it, it can, but it, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but the connection can be stretched. For example, I was always interested in reading, and probably you are as well, comments on different articles or YouTube videos. So that's really gold for research, but there was always a question, how do you research it? if people post anonymously or you don't even know if people posted it exactly or like their bots etc so analyzing that discourse of course is valid and great and interesting but then i would ideally want to always 
support that with kind of talking to some people mm -hmm. embedding in that sense the online in the offline the way we live our life as well like I mean it's we are all kind of pushed to use technology a lot more but still like our lives are a combination of <laughs> functioning in physical reality and uh, so like I think research ideally should do that and then what was my biggest concern was that if I'm going to switch entirely to analyzing um, this course I find online, how do I actually make the connection to the offline world? And I think I cannot do that right now, but uh, one of the ideas I got because of this digital push was, for example, this, like you, you know, I'm interested in extremists, in extreme nationalism, the way they other, in the way they construct enemies and blame and like and find scapegoats and then you know we, we talked about this before but uh, so you know but I'll repeat it <laughs> because of the podcast uh, we talked about the many of the societies that we are familiar with the extreme discourse is not really that much different from what let's call them everyday people talk about maybe they you know then don't join those kinds of groups or don't want to kill somebody because they're this or that, but still they're going to produce the same tropes. So ideally, I would like to actually now just base my research online, collect uh, the discourse from different websites or social media that are in some way connected to certain extremist groups. But then in the next stage, after the post-corona stage, have focus groups with people who are not or don't consider themselves radical and kind of test out how much of these things are really very normal for them. That's how I'm going to try to solve my biggest concern. And what was your biggest concern in switching to the online <laughs> research only? My biggest concern, as I, uh, as I said previously, was actually to, to define what this digital or mm -hmm. online world is and uh, where do I look, uh, why do I look there, and defining this field and trying to to understand to embed myself into certain space or understanding this in any it, it was just very confusing for me now to to try to justify why i approached mm -hmm. this web page or this forum or this mm -hmm. group or whatever but not only that the the other big issue that i also had is um, of course, we know now that a lot of people have uh, smartphones and computers and everyone are online and so on and so on. But it's still very hard to understand uh, the reach of, of anything that actually happens online. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite different from, from a commemorative event that I otherwise visit and uh, see people, talk to people, uh, greet them, recognize them from the previous year you know, mm -hmm. participate and observe, while participant observation in digital ethnography is something that is suddenly becoming very challenging for me because I actually am not sure what do I participate from the comfort of my chair, because as you said, who are people who leave comments? Are they people after mm -hmm. all? Those were my main issues with facing myself with the screen mm -hmm. <laughs> where everything else happens. Mm -hmm. Do you have maybe some particular methodological issues with it? Did you think about them? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I see actually ethical challenges as part of methodological challenges always. What are you allowed to use like from the things you find online is particularly tricky. And I know there's more and more literature dealing uh, uh, with it or trying to, you know, solve some issues or give some recommendations. And one of the kind of rule of thumb that, uh, that they have is, uh, I mean, anything that's posted publicly or in public discussion, uh, groups or forums is fair game for analysis. And then that those things that are not so like they're in private profiles maybe shouldn't be unless you ask for consent etc the way we would do it in in uh, everyday like uh, not everyday but uh, but person uh, in person uh, ethnography or interviews one of the biggest methodological issues that's not only ethical uh, but partially is i think there's gold in the so-called dark social media such as like you know a lot of 
people I know kind of moved from expressing or sharing things in Facebook or Instagram to actually just having uh, private groups on Viber or WhatsApp and how do we analyze that, you know, how do we access that? But I think that's where a lot of really good conversation happens, especially about or when it comes to othering or rejection. So that's uh, that would be a big methodological challenge. How do you analyze WhatsApp? Somebody's private. Well, you know, like I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, it, I think it relates nicely to what, what with my concerns as well because. Uh, once you are actually in this type of uh, WhatsApp group mm -hmm. or uh, Viber or any type of private uh, communication mm -hmm. channels, you basically do have this opportunity to do something much closer to mm -hmm. participant observation than you do only by reading uh, content online but it on the other hand as you said it's very mm -hmm. tricky to to actually it is and even if you have access to it say you're part of that group well, how do you then uh, use the, the material you get there? Is it enough to just an anonymize it or do you have to actually announce yourself as a researcher as well? Like, so say, yeah, I'm here as your family member, but also I'm doing, I want to look at what you say. Like, do you do that? What do you do? And that way, I mean, uh, ideally you do, you're as like open and honest as possible. But my concern is you influence the material that way. You also like create skepsis potentially, or if not, you basically navigate the, the discussion and influence how it's going to unfold, which you do also when you do participant observation. Yeah, I just wanted to say that yeah. it's, it's always this dilemma yeah. that, that leaves us. So, so in that terms, that if, if we have this dilemma in, in a Viber group, but mm -hmm. again, similar dilemma in, in a bar mm -hmm. with people, right. uh, then how, what do you think? How actually different it is di doing digital? I mean, except the obvious mediated yeah. differences, but uh, being not being there. Mm. But otherwise, in terms of ethics and in mm -hmm. terms of subjectivity that is it actually any different than it really isn't and then like i mean i just uh downloaded i didn't get to read it today i downloaded an article that really like the abstract uh, caught my attention because it was arguing that uh, when when we engage in participatory observation we never really co-create uh, you know uh, on equal terms with people we kind of observe <laughs> Because there's always this discrepancy between the role of researcher and others, and usually the power is on the side of researcher. It depends who you do research on, but uh, I've noticed a lot of that. For example, when I, you know, when I did that research with uh, forced migrants, and then you interview them as migrants, so that's not the only of course identity they have, but you're gonna invite them to um, an interview. Because, okay, because you, you were born here and grew up there, so you already cast them in a certain role, so already that's your power as a researcher. And of course, they voluntarily accept that, that's not an issue, but then the whole time during the communication, you co-create, of course, the material with them, and that's in some ways good, but in some ways there's always this power you have. Uh, whether you want it or not and like oftentimes it happened to me I don't know if this would be like happen online as well if I say hey I'm a researcher in this group and I'm gonna I'm interested in this and that and you guys go ahead and talk and I'll jump in and talk and then like what happened to me in, with in-person interviews was that people would ask me at the end did I talk well did I say what you wanted to say you know things like that which is not at all my intention to make that kind of power imbalance between us but then I feel like that would be the case maybe in, in some in announced presence in online discussion as well that people would weigh what they say and want to check with you if they did good <laughs> you know hey teacher how did I do yeah. and that's yeah maybe not really directed that uh, directly and only related to our topic today but uh, comes to my mind what do you think yeah, I, I completely agree with you and uh, I think that it's, uh, it's an issue that uh, anthropology and any type of ethnographic, mm -hmm. uh, re any other social research that employs ethnographic methods mm -hmm. 
uh, cannot escape and it's something that was imposed from well recognized let's say from the very beginning of the use of ethnography mm -hmm. in social researches and uh, I, I guess there is no way to emancipate from that as mm -hmm. long as you recognize your positionality in the research so uh, I think the the online uh, ethnography or digital ethnography mm -hmm. actually doesn't change that problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of just confirms that it exists mm -hmm. and it's there mm -hmm. well i asked you because i was listening to an interesting uh, podcast with sarah pink uh, who is uh, i guess we can call her a digital ethnographer mm -hmm. and she said uh, when when i started to think actually when we started to think together this field of, uh, of digital and digital ethnography and digital anthropology uh, I, I really felt as it is something very separate from, from our res experience as researchers, mm -hmm. researchers. but uh, then by reading a little bit and discussing it with you, I realized that uh, there are kind of two directions that can be taken in just thinking about it. One is that uh, when we talk about digital ethnography, we actually talk can talk about ethnography of digital communities, mm -hmm. but then on the other hand, we can talk about uh, uh, employing digital methods in observation or mm -hmm. in uh, in our wider uh, ethnographic mm -hmm. methods. And um, I, I really liked what Sarah Pink said, and I'm going to link uh, this uh, podcast in in the on our web page. And um, she said basically that for her, um, digital ethnography is actually contemporary ethnography. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of emphasized how hard it is to, to put apart digital mm -hmm. from non-digital. And then she said it's contemporary ethnography. And by that she means it's ethnography of contemporary mm -hmm. and using contemporary approach to ethnography. So I, I think... Um, that we should not only think digital ethnography, but we should actually rethink once again our contexts that mm -hmm. are so much uh, interconnected and interpreted with digital. Mm -hmm. That actually we don't talk about the digital, but we are part of this digital constantly as we are recording mm -hmm. ourselves now and this will be put online. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much, Dragana. I, I'm really looking forward to continuing this uh, work with you. And uh, I hope we can also bring some guests in the future and discuss with uh, other researchers who, who already did something that we could call digital ethnography about their experiences and raise more questions about what, what actually digital ethnography is. I'm looking very much forward to that. <laughs> Thank you so much and uh, hear you soon. Bye. Bye.